Okay, so we're talking about the human heart. This will be part two. I did 20 or 30 scriptures in part one. I tried to be brief and to the point, but now we're going to do part two. Okay, so part two, let's just keep going. Where were we? We went down to, okay, so we're at 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22. It talks about how we have been sealed by God and he has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. This is like when you go to the store and you buy a loaf of bread and you pay the money for the bread. What do you get? You get a receipt. And that receipt says that you purchased this item at this time for this amount of money and that the item is legally yours now because you paid fair market value for it. And so someone can't come chasing you out of the grocery store saying, uh, you bring that bread back. You stole the bread. No, I have my receipt. It's proof. See, and that's what the Lord has put in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is a seal, and that seal is permanent. And a seal is like when you seal a canning jar, it's sealed. It's permanent. 2 Corinthians 3.3, 3, this talks about how the Spirit of the living God has written on our hearts, not with ink, but by the Holy Spirit. He has literally written on our hearts all the precepts, all the laws of God. He's written those on our hearts. You know how the Lord wrote on the tablets of stone? Well, they're making a parallel between that and how the Holy Spirit has written on our hearts. This is literally in the spirit realm. You're going to see when you get to heaven, if you can take your heart out and look at it, it's going to have <laughs> the everything about the Lord all on it. Because the laws of God are written in our hearts. He has internalized those for us by putting them, writing them himself on our hearts. So that's how we have the heart of Christ because he has given us a new heart and he has written the laws of love on our hearts. 2 Corinthians 3.15 But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. This is talking about the law. Whenever you read the law... Or when you read a scripture out of context, you twist it and read it as if that scripture is talking about the law. That really just shows that the law is in your heart. But when Moses is read, it's talking about when you read the law or when you mention the law, immediately a veil covers your heart. And in that process of veiling your heart, you believe that God has not done all the things that he's done, that, that the curtain has not been torn in the temple, that um, Christ's sacrifice is insufficient. You start to believe all these lies under the law. That's why I encourage people to come out from under the law because you don't want that veil on your heart. You don't want that veil on your heart that says, Christ's sacrifice really wasn't quite enough. You need to do something to add to it or you're not good enough. All of that garbage comes in when we get the veil on our hearts. So you want to stay away from the veil. And you do that by staying away from trying to perform the law. Because the only way you could perform the law is if you're Jesus Christ and you're perfect. And so when you try to perform the law, you're saying that you're God Almighty. And that is narcissism. It's arrogance. It's just foolish. 2 Corinthians 4.1 As we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. So we have received the mercy of the Lord and we can receive the mercy of other people. And when we do this, we don't lose heart because mercy strengthens the heart, just like grace strengthens the heart. Hebrews talks about mercy strengthens the heart. So if you receive mercy from God uh, continually, then you will not lose heart. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So when we give to others of our time, our resources, our energy, our money, our whatever it is, we want to give freely and cheerfully. And that means that the Holy Spirit is leading us in doing that. He wants us to give as much as we purpose in our hearts in accordance with what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. So with your money, if you want to give 10%, that's fine. But a tithe in the Old Testament was more like 20% plus a lot of other stuff. And it wasn't money. It was um, grain and it was different things like that. So you can do whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to, but you need to have peace about it. And you need to be sure that's the Holy Spirit. And usually 
When you're cheerful about it, that is the Holy Spirit. He gives you joy in giving because you know God will provide for you. Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So because we are sons and daughters of God, we know that God has sent His Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, into our hearts. And so that is why when you hear someone talking about the Heavenly Father, you know deep in your heart that He is your Father. Even if you don't know Him very well, or if you have blockages from wounds that your Father inflicted on you, you know deep down below all that that He is your real Father. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love it goes on there but this one part of the passage in verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith through our faith that God has given us Christ dwells in our hearts the holy spirit is the spirit of Jesus so the holy spirit is Jesus dwelling in our hearts and the more We allow the Holy Spirit to take over rooms and closets and different places in our hearts, the more we will be rooted and grounded in love and the more we will be stable and we will make good, uh, sober-minded decisions even when things come along that make us want to do uh, foolish things. Okay, Ephesians 5, 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. This is a wonderful way to participate in the Holy Spirit leading you through your day. When you speak to other people who are believers in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, and when you sing and you make melody in your heart to the Lord and you worship Him throughout the day, this makes your day easier. The Holy Spirit carries you through it, and it protects you from a lot of thoughts that you don't want to come into your head and a lot of detours that the enemy can throw in front of you. Philippians 1.7 I have you in my heart. The scripture is telling us that we can hold a person or a group of people in our hearts. We can hold them with affection. And so we can have different people in our hearts because we love them. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So this peace of God that we can get from him through praying and with our supplications given and submitted to him, he can give us this peace that passes all understanding and no one can understand it, but it's the peace of God and it's how heaven is all the time. But we just get to experience it down here in certain circumstances and the scripture tells us how in Philippians 4. It also, besides giving us peace, guards our hearts and our minds. That peace does that. And so that's a great thing to have and to keep. And Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That means you do things when you have peace about it. You let peace be the umpire in your heart. When someone says, oh, let's go do this, and you think, I don't really have peace about that. That's what they're talking about. They're letting peace be the umpire of their heart. If they have peace about something, they'll do it. If they don't have peace, they'll wait for God to give them the peace before they do it. Colossians 3.16, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This goes back to the previous verse I mentioned about singing hymns and spiritual songs to one another and in your heart to the Lord. This is a very excellent way to participate in the Holy Spirit leading you throughout the day. 1 Thessalonians 2.4 It is God who tests our hearts. So he's not the one that tempts us, but he's the one that tests us. So he can call the enemy up to set up something to test your heart. And he's not the one tempting you, but he wants to see what you're going to do when you are tempted or through a trial or whatever it may be. 1 Thessalonians 3.13, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father. That he may establish your hearts blameless. Sorry, that's the, uh, if you can hear it, that is the cleaning lady. I have to ignore that. You'll hear some bumps and clashes and clangs in the background. But anyway, um, he can establish, the Lord can and will, over time, establish your heart 
to be blameless in holiness before him. Yes, he can do this. Yes, he will do it. Yes, ask him to do this in you. Establish my heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father. That can be your prayer and he will do it. But if you don't believe that he can and will, then he won't. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And as you have believed, so it shall be unto you, Jesus said. So you have to believe it and agree with him. And then all kinds of things start happening. Second Thessalonians 3, 5. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. The Lord has done this with my heart. I had love in my heart, but I didn't have enough patience. And the years that I was impatient, it wasn't really that I was doing things that were showing my impatience. It was in my heart. I felt it. I felt this impatience in my heart and it felt wrong and the Lord has had to transform my heart and he's directed my heart into the love of God and into the patience of Christ because the patience of Christ is endless up until the time of judgment but he has given me that and I'm very thankful. 2 Timothy 2.22 Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So in the scriptures, it tells us different things to pursue. And this is going along with Matthew 6, 33, which says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Well, this verse is talking about pursuing righteousness in that same way. And in our pursuing righteousness, we have to have faith, love, and and peace. And we can pursue those things when we pursue righteousness. But it all comes from the faith that God has given us. And the people that pursue these type things are usually the ones that have pure hearts. If you don't have a pure heart, ask the Lord to give you a pure heart. Philippians 1.20 says, talks about refreshing my heart in the Lord. And so we can do this. We can refresh our own hearts in the Lord. The Word of God can refresh your heart in the Lord and the Holy Spirit can refresh your heart in the Lord and other people that are filled with the Spirit can refresh your heart in the Lord. Even being in nature for me refreshes my heart in the Lord. Hebrews 3 8 says do not harden your hearts. This is a warning and it's very dangerous and foolish to harden your hearts. That usually comes from bitterness, rebellion, when you're trying to control God and trying to make him do things and he doesn't do it because he's God and you're not, and then you get angry, that is the part of you that wants to be God. And you have to lay that part of you on the altar and let it burn. Hebrews 3.10, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. These are people that want their own way. They do not want to submit to the Lord. They do not want to know him. They do not want to know his ways. They just want maybe all of the benefits of that without really doing what he says. Hebrews 3.12, Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. See, a heart of unbelief, I feel very convicted about to share that that is evil, very evil in the eyes of God, not to believe what he says. That a heart that has unbelief in it is an evil heart. And when you don't believe God, you're departing from him in that way and in that place. Hebrews 4.12, a discerner of the hearts and intents of the heart. This is talking about the Lord and the Holy Spirit, how he is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart so that you can hide nothing from him. And you shouldn't want to have to hide anything from him because he is your friend and he wants to help you with whatever problem you have. Hebrews 8.10, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. This goes with the scripture we talked about before where the Holy Spirit has literally written the laws of love on your heart. And this is how you were born again. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near to the Lord with a true heart, not a false heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith. Not 50%, not 80%, but 100% assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. If there's anything that's bothering you in your conscience, you can sprinkle your heart with the blood of Jesus and draw near in full assurance of faith. And your bodies can be washed with the pure water of the word. Hebrews 13, 9, For it is good that the heart be established by grace. 
Another word there in place of the word established is strengthened. That's what another one of the translations says. For it is good that the heart be established or and or strengthened by grace. When you are established, that means you are set up with a firm foundation and that not many things can move it. And especially if you're on the rock of Jesus Christ, nothing can move that. So when you establish your heart or you let the Holy Spirit establish your heart in the grace of Jesus Christ, you can stand on the rock through more and more and more storms and attacks from the enemy. And soon nothing will cause you to uh, be moved. James 1.26, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And this is another reason why I'm always telling people to pay attention to their tongues, to bridle their tongues, because without bridling your tongue, your faith is not as strong as it could be. You're deceiving yourself in your heart. And in some ways, what you're doing for the Lord can be seen as useless. So I want you to guard against that. If you think that you're following the Lord, but you don't bridle your tongue, time for some surgery in the heart because the tongue reveals what's in the heart. James 5, 5. You have lived on this earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. When people, especially Americans, live in pleasure and luxury and they don't give to the poor and they don't care for the widows and orphans, they don't visit those in prison, and they just keep wanting to making a bigger, bigger house and getting more and more merchandise and things for themselves, the Lord is warning them that their hearts have been fattened in a day of slaughter and that they have done it to themselves, that the Lord has not done it, but they have done it. And then James 5, 8 talks about establishing your hearts. And that word establish, again, means to strengthen, to fix firmly. So in the grace of God, you can strengthen and establish your heart. That's what the scripture says back in uh, Hebrews 13, 9. That is how to strengthen and establish your heart by receiving the grace of God. It will strengthen it, it will establish it, and it will fix it firmly so that it cannot be moved. Why? Because you're strengthening and establishing your heart on the rock of Jesus Christ. You get to know the rock of Jesus Christ by receiving his grace. Whenever you fight the grace of God, you're being a fool. Bottom line. 1 Peter 1.22 Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth... Through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. So this is saying that you can purify your soul when you obey the truth. In obeying the truth, you have, past tense, purified your soul. So because you are in the faith, your soul is pure. There's nothing you have to do to purify your soul because the faith does that for you. And God gave you that faith. So, through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. This verse is also telling us that we can love one another fervently when we have a pure heart. When we don't have a pure heart here, it's saying that you're going to have trouble loving other people. And you won't be able to do it fervently. 1 Peter 3, 4, the hidden person of the heart it talks about. So, we can see someone on the outside. Oh yeah, they're this, they're that. But you don't really get to know a person because on the inside, their heart is hidden away. And when you get to know the hidden person of the heart, then you really know that person. 1 Peter 3.15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. So this is saying that we can set the Lord God apart in our hearts. And in doing so, we will be ready always to give a defense or an answer or some type of explanation or at least a testimony to someone if they ask us about our faith. So that's saying don't let the Lord get mixed up and diluted with everything else in your heart. Set him apart on the throne of your heart. Sanctify him. Set him apart so that it will be easy and effortless and a no-brainer when you need to give a defense. 2 Peter 2.14 may have a heart trained in covetous practices. So this verse is telling us that some people train their hearts in being envious and in 
um, wanting what other people have. And the more that you do that, the more of a pattern is laid down in your heart to continue to do it. And this is evil, but this is also letting us know that we can train our, our own hearts in righteousness because all you got to do is lay down that track and then just keep running on it and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper and the old track you used to run on that was not as good just grows over with uh, thorns and bushes and different things and you don't go down that path anymore three more first john three twenty. for if our heart condemns us god is greater than our heart and knows all things so this is saying that your heart can be confused the conscience of your heart can be confused by having a parental voice in your head that is condemning you for something that god knows all about and that he's not condemning you for it so sometimes if your heart condemns you your conscience can be off can be missing the mark and so God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things and he understands so that spirit of condemnation is really never from the Lord so you don't even need to listen to it it's just a waste of your time not the Holy Spirit Proverbs fifteen thirteen, heartache crushes the spirit oh my goodness this speaks to most of my life <laughs> heartache I've had so much heartache in my life and my spirit was crushed from a very young age and it stayed crushed a lot of most of my life I'd say there were times where it wasn't but the majority of my life my spirit was crushed because I had so much heartache you know when you have a desire a wish or a will and it's you don't get it it crushes your spirit and that was the way my life was so I can that that verse really goes all the way into my heart and then the last one is revelation 17 17 for god has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of god are fulfilled so this is saying when god prophesies something like when it's prophesied in the old testament god puts things into people's hearts to do his will in exodus it talks about how he uh, hardened the Pharaoh's heart because he had a plan. God had a plan and it was going to take place. And we are just like, you know, pieces on the uh, chessboard or the checkers on the checkerboard. And he's doing so many things and we're not even aware of it. But he puts the his own purpose into the hearts of people who have hardened their hearts toward him. And he can put this unity this one world spirit this one world new world order this globalism that is so big today the lord has put that into their hearts to fulfill his purpose because the antichrist is going to rise up and be worshiped and in that all of these unbelievers in the lord jesus christ alone are going to be of one mind and they're going to give their kingdom to the beast and so this is prophesied and this is going to happen and it says he will do this until the words of God are fulfilled so I've listed 20 or 30 in the part one and 20 or 30 in part two so I didn't have to make a part three so I hope this is helpful for you and I hope that again you will submit your heart to the Lord and submit your entire being to the Lord and let him do whatever he wants because he is your God and he is the potter and he's a good potter and you're the clay and the more warm and soft you can make your heart the easier it's going to be for him to mold and to conform and all those good things when your heart is hard or when it's cold or lukewarm it's not as easily molded and you're going to have more pain and suffering in the conformity and in the molding because he's going to do it whether you like it or not so the best thing you can do is to keep your heart warm and soft and it makes it easier because you're cooperating with him. Okay, so you guys have a great day and I'll see you soon.